Mahalo. After I'm hearing um, Mary Ann's uh, talk, I'm going to throw in all this artistry in my Hawaiian language right now and all these particles and things. But anyway, uh, I'm scheduled on your program for an hour presentation. So, Homanawanui, Homanawanui, we'll put our hunger off a little bit. Um, so, I'm, I'll be presenting on uh, new words for Hawaiian immersion. And um, uh, major concerns would be getting a community to be receptive. So how do we get people to be kind to uh, new words? In other words, that, that's not a lousy word, or that doesn't sound like it's a Hawaiian word, or uh, Iroquois word, or a Cayuga word, or how, how, and who gives us the authority to do that? When our languages are dying and we're trying to bring it back, we're in the mode of revitalization. And uh, we have come uh, into a new time, as well as bringing the old into the new and moving forward. So in Hawaii, uh, Hawaiian immersion or medium schools are the current life for the uh, Hawaiian language. So in, in a very short uh, statement and um, pictures here, you can see this has given us uh, the, um, the platform for um, those two questions about how receptive are uh, people to a new word, people who are in the mode of revitalization, and also um, the authority. But the authority comes from the people who use the language. And when we have people who are new speakers of the language, they have the authority. So those people who have gone before us, unfortunately, will be here as much as we can have them be here, uh, but there's a new, there are new generations of people coming about speaking our language, and that's what revitalization will take us into that, into that realm, that new life for our language. Uh, so I have to go back and think about these things that happened in Hawaii, and in 19, in May 20, on May 20th, 1972. Um, we had this concern, like we're all doing today, uh, recognizing this concern, our language is dying. Now what are we gonna do about it? Um, we had to, I use the, this military word, re, uh, reconnaissance. Uh, well, just evaluating the whole situation, and then what are we gonna do, responding to it? So for example, we had this little conference in 1972 and very short conference. In the morning, we had some demonstrations about how we're teaching our language, uh, basically for second language learners, of course, at the university level or in elementary schools as a subject like you would learn French or Spanish or German. And then we had, uh, cons uh, we discussed in the afternoon, we had a panel about uh, scar uh, scarcity of qualified teachers uh, what are we going to do about that? An insufficient amount of uh, properly prepared material for all levels, like the levels like uh, Marianne was just talking about, from fluency of native speakers all the way down to beginning at Hawaiian 101 and working your way up to the next course, Hawaiian 201, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, uh, we had other kinds, all kinds of um, uh, what you call concerns, pronunciation of our place names, for example, or we have lots of street names in Hawaii, names in Hawaiian, and also orthography, spelling, translation, all of these kinds of concerns back in 1972. And the same day, we were looking at how many Hawaiian dictionaries we had, what kind of dictionaries were there, we had listed 10, we looked at our language texts that were, that were available, our grammar texts, our phrase books, et cetera, what kind of material existed. And in 1972, I started a radio show. Uh, this was just prior to that little conference we had. We started in February, the conference was in May. And it came about because I was teaching Hawaiian at the university, and I'm still teaching Hawaiian at the University of Hawaii from 1971. So I used to take uh, native speakers like Ms. Um, Marianne just did 
and I said, we're going to learn this Hawaiian uh, because we were teaching Hawaiian at the university from 1921. That's a long time. And the way it was being taught was not for, for speaking purposes. It was for translation, you know, taking some of our literature, Hawaiian uh, stories, uh, beautiful stories, and uh, all kinds of texts that we have in Hawaiian, and just translating them into English and trying to learn that way. So it was kind of an academic exercise, but not really this, the language that our speakers were using. So students said to me, why don't you just talk to our speakers uh, on a radio so everybody can hear it, not just on a tape recorder. So luckily we still had speakers and we did conduct this radio show from uh, 16 years, from 1972 to 1988. Uh, and I recorded almost all of them. Some I had to miss, but nearly all. So we have over 550 hours and uh, 417 programs. As you can see in, in some of the photos, we had speakers that were very old. The oldest there uh, that I've had was 19, uh, she was 95 years old, Kaka'i Kalehiana, born in 1878. And then we have uh, some younger speakers from one little island that is isolated enough so that 200 people could carry on within their own little isolated community, this island that was, is still privately owned, so no one is allowed to go there. Uh, and the island came with the people when it was so, anyway, so that's how come we have the last uh, community there. And today, it is nearly uh, wiped out. And also we conducted uh, language fairs, you could say, you know, festivals, and we brought together our native speakers with our second language learners to encourage um, interaction as much as possible. And as you can see, our native speakers were older people. So it was in a matter of short time that they wouldn't be around anymore. And those were festive things, they're competitive language, and this was second language learners hearing from other places, other university campuses, or a few high schools that were teaching Hawaiian and how they were te learning Hawaiian. So bringing them on stage, literally, uh, immediately told the audience uh, the caliber of uh, fluency and how they're learning their lang our language. And then also I, I took my students out to what I called uh, Hawaiian language live-ins with a, a few native speaking uh, people, families that I got to know and who allowed us to go and stay at their house for a, couple, for a week or so, or a little longer. And wherever they were, we would go and just stay with them and just speak Hawaiian, totally, everything. And then we started our Punana Leo, or the so-called language nest, in 19, actually in 1983 we got established, but we actually started the first um, two schools I, I'll back up a little bit. We, we started one school, the first school in 1984, but we had to close it after about six, about six months or so because our native speakers, they're all native speaking teachers, but they gave in to English. So we we're wasting our time doing English and Hawaiian. So we said, this is not gonna work. We'll take a break. So we took a break on that site and then we opened up two more and conducted, and this particular, these pictures depict the one that was in Honolulu, the, the main city in, in Hawaii. And um, we were lucky to have native speakers there. And uh, they were from the island of Niihau. And they conducted their, their uh, the school all in the language. They didn't know how to really uh, conduct a educational program for preschool. We're not uh, giving uh, child care or babysitting. So we had to work on that at the same time. For them to speak the language was not a problem at all. So it was the other way, uh, the other concerns about how to conduct um, a program from 7 in the morning to about 4.30 in the afternoon, five days a week. 
And so after about three months, our children started to speak the language to each other and, uh, of course, to the teachers. And the parents were left in the dust, as we say. And then, uh, of course, we were creating new words. Immediately, we needed words, for example, like independent activity, snacks. How do we say that? Because we can have food, all kinds of food, but how do we do little snacky things? Uh, and uh, playhouse, how do we say the word for playhouse? Or trace an image or tongs and things like that that were being used in the curriculum at the um, Punanaleo. And then um, 1987, we started, we, our children got to be five and six years old, so we went to our State Department of Education and said our children must continue to be educated in our language, and we had to convince them about that. So we brought people over like Dorothy Lazor and um, another Maori friend of ours, um, Timote Karetu, because they had started programs where they lived in immersion, and for the state of Hawaii or the United States to use a native language as a medium of instruction was brand new. So I had to convince the Board of Education that this would not damage the children or uh, they would learn English, don't worry about that. But our worry was to keep our Hawaiian alive. So uh, Dorothy helped us in that regard because they were, you, she had started, or you, those of you who are part of that program, uh, being involved in Mohawk uh, immersion education. She also came over to help us uh, uh, create, you see that picture on your right there. Uh, just about four of us, five, six, the two that were not in the picture, uh, uh, start to make elementary school curriculum. As you know, we can't purchase that. We have to make our own, make our own curriculum, make our own teachers. Okay, so then we started a actually kind of a formal committee on new words or Hawaiian lexicon committee. And we tried to use in this committee all native speakers. And most of them, as you can see, were like me now, white hair. And that was back in 1988. The hard thing with our native speakers is they had very difficult time to, to um, uh, how do I say, contend with or put up with uh, creating new words. We were wasting uh, words like uh, school content words, you know, football words, uh, halfback and receivers and things like that, or hiking the ball or pitching a pitch and getting to first base and things like that. They didn't play. While they were growing up, they were speakers of the language, but they were only using it until maybe they were about 12 years old or so, but they weren't using it at school, which was all in English and on the playground. But when they got home with their parents, they spoke it. Anyway, uh, so old words like evolution and things like that, they just couldn't they would, they would describe it, and that would be a definition in Hawaiian, they explain what is evolution. So that would be a definition, but what is the word? So we, we stopped uh, creating a problem for them, but, so we went into uh, clarification of words that were more familiar with them, such as uh, things like in the bedroom, you have a a bedspread, these are all foreign things, but at the same time, our language was um, being used, you know, for bedspreads, comforters, sheets, pillowcases, etc. cetera, uh, uh, you know, floor mats and things like that that were being introduced. And that was a little bit more productive to clarify some, you know, some confusion sometimes. We don't have um, any major how do you say differences or, uh, you know, in, in our language, except maybe some vocabulary words might be different on one location and, and another it would be something else, but no major uh, concern as far as that kind of uh, differences were. 
And then, of course, we advanced all the way. Our emergent schools started in 1987, and the first graduating class was in 1999. And here we have some, the first five seniors, two, four, no, there should be five. Yeah. And that's, there are two schools. This is one school on our island that I live on now, which is Hawaii. And the other school is on Oahu, where the big jet planes land in Honolulu, and where Waikiki is. So anyway, these students um, came back to their little punanaleo nest in that photo on your left bottom, and are hugging their little, ch the little children there, where they once were. So they, in fact, are the students that came through the whole, uh, uh, they were the pioneers of the first immersion program. Oahu, they had six, and over here in, I mean, on Hawaii, they had five first graduates. So we were not big in numbers, but I think we were very successful. And as the years went on, of course, we're getting, we always want to get better. So, and then we were keeping very busy at the university level while this was happening in the community. Uh, we first, the first uh, Hawaiian Studies bachelor's degree at Manoa's 1980, 1982, it was at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. We have 10 different campuses representing the University of Hawaii, but only two are major um, campuses. And so Hilo is one, the other is Manoa on Oahu. In 1989 at UH Hilo, we started Hawaiian Language Center to um, assist the Department of Education to make curriculum and teacher training for the Hawaiian Immersion Programs. Our teaching training was not official until 2000, mm, 2000, was it 2000? No, it was earlier, in, sorry. Uh, about 1996, 97, uh, we had to go to the department for at least two years. Uh, we didn't quite make it the first round, we, but we made it the second round. And so we got officially approved as a teacher training program to specifically address uh, Hawaiian immersion teachers. And the license also represents, can also, um, qualify the teachers to teach in the English uh, language schools as well. In 1997, we started the College of Hawaiian Language. Prior to that, we were just a little department in the College of Arts and Science. I mean, yeah, department in the College of Arts and Sciences. <clears throat> in 1998, we were the first to have a um, graduate uh, master's program in Hawaiian language and literature. And then 2004, we started the doctorate program in Hawaiian and indigenous language and culture, which Teho is now one of the um, candidates at that program. And 2007, of course, we also started a master's program in our indigenous language and culture education for our, for our teachers. And then at the Halikuobo Hawaiian Language Center, we create curriculum, as I said, and also one of the major functions is the teacher training program. So here you see a few pictures um, showing curriculum material and also some of our graduates. This, every summer we, we have a cohort of, uh, uh, of teacher uh, trainer, uh, uh, candidates to be in our Kahua Viola teacher training program. These are, are uh, pictures depicting those who have graduated in the, in the past. Uh, if we get eight or seven people, that's pretty good. Yeah, we'd like to, of course, to have more. Uh, our schools, we number uh, over 20, about 21 sites. But right now we have six full-fledged uh, schools from kindergarten up to high school. Yeah, and so we need a lot more teachers. Uh, we're struggling with that. But our young people getting very committed, involved, and therefore, uh, if they can uh, pass uh, all the coursework at the university level uh, and, um, and pass the exams to qualify to get into the teacher training program, 
they can come in. So every summer we start with uh, five weeks of intensive uh, beginning training of the um, teacher cohort. Uh, and it takes, um, so summer and then fall and then spring. Well, during the fall and uh, spring, they're on in schools working with their mentors, mentor teachers on the job. And at the same time, they're also taking uh, coursework after, after teaching at school, so more like four o'clock in the afternoon to maybe six in the evening, one or two courses. Now, I'm supposed to be talking about creating new words. So, of course, we looked at how our old people did it, and we all have interesting stories, I'm sure. And so, for example, a very common way of getting a new word is just to hear it from that foreign concept. So we didn't have cattle or cows or beef. So the first word we heard for this particular animal was beef. So we said pee pee. Sounds like pee pee in our word, in our language. And then all of a sudden the goat appeared and, and uh, we, it looked like a pee pee. But <laughs> You know, and then we started to hear the word cow, C-O-W, cow. So we'll just say, we call that one pee pee, and we call this one cow. <laughs> okay, so we got that one. Uh, in other words, Hawaiianizing the English sound, and I guess you do that too. Yeah. Or the foreign sound. Then we also extend some of our traditional uh, concepts. So we have the word to write, which we never wrote before. Our languages, our language was always oral. So then we have tattooing, and in tattooing it appeared like writing, the the verb. So the verb tattoo is kakau, and as you know, the English word tattoo comes from the Polynesian word tatau, because the English couldn't pronounce it very well, so they go tattoo. And then when it's down on paper, uh, the writing, the noun, is pala pala, because we had it apply the tattoo onto the skin, and the skin, or uh, I would say, that now we're transferring over, not to the skin, but we have paper bark cloth. And on our paper bark cloth, we put our designs, and the design is pala pala. So, a small example of our paper bark cloth with designs on it. It looks like writing sometimes. So that's the word we transferred for, by extending uh, traditional uh, words that we have. And so do we get confused sometimes when we want to say kakao and mean tattoo? Yes, we do. And we want to say pala pala for design on a, on a paper bark cloth. Yes, we do. But basically, we don't because of the context. We just extended it and it seems to be working. Another thing is transferring something familiar to something new. And so, for example, we never had horses, so we had dogs, however, and we also had pigs. So th those are the two main big animals we had. And so we didn't use the pig to compare the horse to, we used the dog. So the word for dog is li uh, elio, and what they did is just drop a couple sounds, a glottal and a long uh, uh, E sound, and left it with Leo. So it'll be kind of connected to the dog, E Leo and Leo. So these are, for example, some of the ways our old people um, dealt with new concepts. Now we have to extend it very rapidly into current times all kinds of things like computers, et cetera, et cetera. And so we come up with 12 kind of guidelines uh, for our lexicon or new words committee. And here are some of them. And they may be a little confusing because um, uh, this might, some of them might be just like differences. So we make a minor change to a word that already exists. I think that's like uh, elio and leo making it, just dropping a couple of sounds. Uh, new meanings of old words assigned by native speakers. So we have, uh, like we said, kakao for writing, tattoo, but it's tattoo as well. 
or reduplication of ex existing words to alter or extend the meaning. So we have a word and we just say, we, we, because we have this form of, of reduplicating. So if we had kai, we can say kai kai. And that sounds, uh, uh, what is the word? Uh, okay, you know, it, it doesn't offend our, speak, our speakers. That's what we, we're gonna be concerned about. We want to still maintain, uh, it sounds okay, it sounds Hawaiian, doesn't sound Japanese or Filipino, uh, and it has some Hawaiian-ness to it. So, for example, I know sometimes, uh, you know, we even fool our native speakers because we didn't have a word for native speaker, so we created one. And um, the way we know it works is because the native speaker says to us, who are you guys up at the university or whoever this committee is? And, you know, we are the Manaleo, we are the native speakers, they should be asking us. And she's using the word that we created to describe what she's <laughs> identifying with as a native speaker. Is that we made the word. But we'll say, oh, to Tudes, right, we will consult with you. And by the way, we do have native speakers that we consult with uh, because on the current committee, we don't have a native speaking, all native speaking. Uh, what we, we use native speakers only as consultants. We have less than 40 native speakers uh, uh, what do you call it, fluent native speakers today, uh, and et cetera. And, you know, so I won't take up too much of our time going through this whole thing and telling you all examples, but I'll give you a few more down here. This is the book uh, that we published in 2003, but it's much more easier now to put it on lines and less expensive. And so... Uh, we had word lists, and the most current one, as I said, is 2003, and that's at uh, vehevehe.org is where you can find our Hawaiian dictionaries. You can look up words there. So this is alongside the most popular um, Hawaiian dictionary, the Pukui Albert one, and I understand we get over a million hits a month uh, using these dictionaries, both combined. Uh, and uh, this is produced and uh, published by Halikomo, the Hawaiian Language Center, and Ahapunle, in consortium with the Ahapuna Naleo. And, uh, and as I said, this is online at veheve.org. Um, and you can search it. Um, of course, if you don't know the Hawaiian word, you go to the English word, and then you find the Hawaiian word. And this is our very honorable committee. Um, we, and as you can see, we're all men, no wahine, but we're having a wahine come at our next meeting. We, we've had wahine come before. Somehow, it's very, very hard for, um, it's a very hard job to do uh, words. And, uh, but we will try again, just to be kind of fair, you know, to the sexes. So we have that coming up. Uh, and it's good sometimes to have a wahine inside of all of this here. But, uh, we meet now, we used to meet on weekends. Uh, we are a volunteer committee, we don't get paid. They give us lunch and maybe breakfast, if we have breakfast and even you know dinner before, but now we only meet six hours a day, um, all day on a Saturday usually, not on a Sunday. And we fly into the main island, those of us who live on the, there are four of us who are from different islands and you know, and then we have three members on the more central island, so it's easier for the airlines to come in, so we come into that spot and have our meeting. And uh, yeah, it's a very interesting process. Um, but just to make this a little shorter, um, for example, one way of doing words, for the word I was talking about for evolution, the way we approached it was, now how are we gonna do this? Well, it's a length of time. I'm making this very short. And, but we have a word in Hawaiian that has li'u li'u, which is the length of time. But we didn't want to, you know, sometimes we wanna camouflage it. You know, we don't wanna use, extend the same word and it gets to be confusing. 
So luckily in uh, Hawaii or in Polynesia, we have our cousins like the Tongan, Samoan, Maori of New Zealand, Tahitians. We can borrow some of their words. Well, we can't, yeah, we don't tell them, but we just borrow them. And uh, <laughs> it's similar, you know, it's similar. You can do that too, right here. Uh, so we have Liliu from Tongan. And it sounds like Liu Liu, but it is in Hawaiian because it's Tongan, Liliu for the same meaning of length of time. And then we already have a Hawaiian word for, uh, that we've taken from an old word. Ewe is, is a lineage that is um, based on blood, blood connection. So that's the Ewe word. So then we said, okay, we're gonna use guideline six. We didn't say this, but it just happens. Uh, combining these two words, and then we also use a part of a word from another Polynesian language. We're kind of sneaky. Another thing that we uh, want to do is not make our words too long. Now, I think, uh, Mary Ann, you've got a job to do and helping out uh, not having long words. Well, we don't want to have long words. So I don't know how you're going to do that. But. So for evolute, the actual word for the biological evolution, we put together liliwewe because this kind of evolution is, oh yeah, and when we approach a word, you know, sometimes people submit a word, they don't really understand what, they, what meaning, when they, we, I say, what are you folks asking for evolution? You know, there's several kinds of evolution. So sometimes we have to think for them, but that helps because in the process of doing this, we're creating a word that, I don't know what the, where's the root of evolution from? Is it from French, German? Where's, I know the, the shoe, I mean, Lucien, T-I-O-N, is some kind of uh, English rule. The evo, lu, I don't know, maybe it's Greek. But sometimes we have an advantage to help out our users of the word to understand it better because it's in our own language, so liliu, Hopefully the children can, or I don't, I shouldn't say children. Our new speakers will say, uh, yeah, that's liu, 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 and eve. We have the, yeah, liu, liu, eve, of course. Doesn't everybody say that? Yeah, it's so normal. So it's not that new. So that's evolution. Then we come to uh, the evolution of the Volkswagen or something like that. Then we don't have eve anymore. No genes or things involved. So we'll just say, Loli is, is the word for change. So it's a, uh, if you want to take the word apart, liliu is a long length of time, and, and loli is to change over a long period of time. So that's kind of, yeah, common sense, I guess, liliu, loli. And then also in Hawaii, we're known for, because of our isolation, to have this thing called adaptive radiation. Uh, it sounds bad, but it's supposed to be good. So it's evolution. <laughs> <laughs> of the, our native birds that come from only two species of some kind of finch that has evolved and you can see through the beak because of the food, the nectar they take from the flowers, they have evolved their beaks and some of the beaks are seed eating beaks so they're like parrots. Anyway, so now we say liliu velo and velo is a Hawaiian word uh, for a characteristic uh, handed down through a family like a family is known to be, you know, experts in some area or a trait, a characteristic handed down through a family. So then we added in that adjective, so to speak, to the length of time. So we have this advantage when we can create new words to help uh, the users of our words. So it's not from the Greek and it's not from some foreign place, it's from our own place. And then, of course, we're doing this all for our new native speakers. I was just telling Teho that uh, one of the figures he didn't have the other day was about how many new uh, native speakers are being produced from second language parents. So we're estimating about 500. That's pretty good, you know, because we don't have any control of who they marry and who they have babies with. And uh, we don't say to them, <laughs> Uh, look, you guys better speak Hawaiian to your children now. They just are doing it on their own. Ooh, wonderful. Okay, so I think 
I think that is it. Uh, I, and uh, if you have any, uh, any, shall I take questions or no? Are we too hungry? <laughs> five. <laughs> yeah, we we can maybe take uh, five questions or five minutes questions, okay. and maybe uh, for Larry, maybe even for Marianne too, to give her a couple minutes because I know we kind of rush her off the stage, but. Um, <laughs> So what's going to happen, just to update you, um, we're really stuck on time for starting again at at two at 1.30. So uh, people are going to grab their lunch, sit down, and we're going to start again at 1.30. Okay, so we're just going to, it's a, it's a working lunch. eating lunch. Yeah, right? good. Okay, because uh, uh, we're going to need some time to take down the stage anyway for pres next presentation, but a couple minutes. Any questions about creating new words in Hawaiian or, and, oh, go ahead, or anything you saw here on the presentation? Yeah, over there. Right. Uh, well, for example, for math, we're fortunate that, you know, we uh, were an independent country, so we conducted our Department of Instruction at the time. It was called our Department of Education today uh, in Hawaiian from 1840. So we looked at the, uh, the books that were being used back then. Of course, we had to update that very um, a lot. And uh, we, these, these guidelines, like I showed you, so uh, molecular, like molecule, hunaula, we have a word, hunaula, and hunaula is, are you, so if you get on www.org, and all the words that you're maybe thinking of right now in English, try look it up and see if it comes up. So, but that, was that your, how do we, we do create words, we have to create lots of words, and, and right now we have about 7,200. So in the book that's published, there's about 6,500, and the rest is being put online as fast as we can um, process them. So the process is, uh, of course, you have the word, and we want to be sure we have the correct spelling and all of that sounds good. And then the, the, tra the uh, explanation in English, translation, uh, is important because we want to have the right uh, part of speech, how it's going to be used. Um, and, um, you know, if we have uh, cross-references uh, like that, or examples sometimes that we need to help, uh, we use examples to sometimes to clarify the, the meaning of the word. So it takes a little process, a little time to get it online. Yeah, and, and you know, we're, we're really lucky in Hawaii because our, our people used, uh, got to writing and used it a lot. Lots of them got into uh, newspaper uh, business, and so we have newspapers for over 100 years, up until 1948, that were published in Hawaiian. And so in a newspaper, you typically have all, a whole myriad of t topics, not mathematics and maybe science so much, but other things as well. And, and, and the committee also dis decides whether we like them or we don't like them, too. Because most of them are kind of like long explanations. No, yeah, I wish we could do it more often. We don't like, well, we, we, the hardest thing, we only meet six times a year. And we have to meet twice, uh, two separate meetings before a word is approved. So we approve it this time, and then next time we meet, we look at it again make, make, to, just to make sure, and we had some time to, you know, digest it, feel it out a little bit. Then we approve it, then it's official for, from there. From us, anyway. Um, on the job, kind of, just, we just came, yeah. And, and let me say that, you know, uh, we're very, um, we are, we like second language learners who are good. <laughs> 
they have to be good in the language, and that says to us, they studied hard, they know the language, they know the ins and outs, you know, and so that's kind of an important thing that um, native speakers don't have, but I'm not saying native speakers are not good, they're good, because we still consult with them about words, just to check up on some doubts we may have, just to have their ear, to hear it sometimes even. Yep. 